thanks the organizers for the invitation. I'm very happy to be here. It's been a very exciting workshop. It's hard to be on this session. It's, I guess, you know, we're very hard to keep the level from a condition of separation of quantum classical as the previous talk, but I'll try my best. Um, so it's joint, I want to talk about joint work with Amir Kalev, Tony Angli, Cedric Lin, Christophe Svor, and Shao Jivu. Uh, and what we are exploring is whether quantum computers might be useful uh, to give speed ups for convex optimization problems, in particular for a class of convex optimization problems that um, they're called quantum standard definite programming, and I'll explain what they are. Uh, so, okay, we want to one day have a, a universal quantum computer, and we'll soon have some small scale quantum computers with no error correction, and we'd like to understand uh, what can we use them for. And there are many interesting quantum algorithms, and, and maybe we can split it into three categories. One are exponential speed ups. These are right, they really, uh, they are really the reason why we want to build a quantum computer, I guess. So, of course, a, a big application is just simulate quantum physics. Uh, we heard exciting things about Hamiltonian simulation yesterday, and, and there is a lot of work in this area. There's, of course, Schwarz algorithm, there's HHL to solve linear equations, and so on. Uh, sometimes, for some problems, we cannot get exponential speed ups, but we can still get some speed ups quantumly. Uh, we can get some polynomial speed ups. There is Grover's algorithm with square root speed ups, and this leads to uh, polynomial speed ups to really uh, a bunch of other problems. Uh, if one day uh, quantum computers are as cheap as classic computers, it's still a distant goal, but one day it might be true, then they might be relevant. Uh, and there is a bunch of uh, quantum algorithms, as happens classically, that uh, probably they work well, but we just cannot prove it. And we cannot test them also because we don't have the quantum computer. So at the moment, they're just, uh, we are hoping that they might give something interesting. We have some evidence, but many times we cannot we really know if it's like quantum annealing for uh, combinatorial optimization problems, then for low depth for early quantum computers, there is this quantum approximate optimization algorithm, which might give speed ups. We don't know. There's a bunch of proposing in quantum machine learning and, and so on. Uh, so what I want to show is that uh, solving this same definite programming uh, gives the example in each one of these three classes, and, uh, uh, and we'll get to that. OK, so what are these problems? Uh, so, th so they are a class of convex optimization problems, and it's the following. So we have an optimization variable x, which is just a matrix. So x is an n by n matrix. Uh, and we have a bunch of other matrices, c, a1, up to am, and they are the input matrices of the problem. And we have a bunch of numbers, b1 to bm, and they are real numbers, and they are also inputs of the problem. So these matrices, c, a1 to am, and b1 to bm, specify the problem. And our goal is we want to maximize a linear function over, uh, over x, the optimization variable, and the constraint, uh, and the constraints, they are like linear constraints as well, and we have m constraints. But there's also this extra constraint, which is this positive semi-definite constraint, which says that x has to be Hermitian, and all the eigenvalues bigger or equal to zero. Uh, and we can also consider that all these matrices, they are sparse, and s is the sparsity, is the number of non-zero elements in each row, for example. So as a particular case, if all the matrices are diagonal, then we get linear programming. Uh, this is a very simple linear program with n equals 3, m equals 2, right? It's just like um, something of this form. Uh, OK, so there are many applications. I don't want to read this. You can read and keep growing the number of applications of LP and the STPs. Even like, I was surprised in field theory. I have a new colleague at Caltech that he does conformal field theory, and his main area of activity is to apply STPs to conformal field theory. I thought it was a cool application. Uh, but they're really, it's, it's, very, it's very useful uh, class of optimization problems. What are the algorithms that we have? This can be solved in polynomial time in n, m, and all the other parameters. So using three point methods, that's, uh, the action, that's the method that people actually use in practice. The, the running time is something of this form. It's m squared ns plus m n squared. And then log capital R, small r are two parameters that I'm going to define next. They are basically the size of optimal primal and dual solutions. And epsilon is the accuracy you want to solve the problem. So let's just say that you want to compute this up to error plus minus epsilon additive error, for example. Uh, this is good if you, want to, if you really care about the dependence on m and n, uh, which we will. There are better methods. It's called multiplicative weights method. Uh, and improve to linear in m, n, and s, but with a big hit on the complex in terms of the error and these two other parameters. So it depends which application. 
Uh, there is also lower bound, it's very easy to show, uh, that there cannot be anything faster than n plus m, even if everything else is constant. So there are clear limitations like linear time. Right? Uh, okay. So, oh, sorry. And, and this is even if you just want to compute the optimal value, because of course, just to write down the optimal solution takes time n square. Right? Uh, if it's a matrix, if you go to the dual, like m. Okay, so the question really is can quantum help? Right? Uh, are quantum computers maybe helpful to speeding up these algorithms? And on one hand, maybe yes. So first, like this LP is a, is a very natural generalization of linear equations. We change equalities by, by uh, inequalities. And we know right, there are exponential speed ups for, for linear equations. Also, these SDPs, uh, they are pretty natural in quantum mechanics. right? So we can always reduce a general SDP to the following problem. Uh, we give some Hermitian matrices, A1 to AM, like some observable in quantum mechanics, a bunch of numbers, B1 to BM, and we want to find a density matrix rho for which the expectation value of rho in each one of these measurements or these Hermitian operators AI is smaller than BI. Right? So this is a, a very natural problem in quantum mechanics, and so maybe quantum can help. There's also, on the other hand, some other. Uh, on, on the other hand, maybe not. So first, uh, uh, f reducing from Grover, there is an easy quantum lower bound of uh, other square root n plus square root m. So there will be definitely no general exponential speed up uh, in the worst case. And even polynomial speed ups, uh, we didn't know how to do before, right? So it's, it's a natural problem to consider, but it wasn't done before, so maybe that's a sign uh, that it's bad news. Uh, okay, so what I want to show you now is, is that uh, we, can, uh, we can have some speed ups, and the way to see that really quantum uh, ought to help is, is just to connect this problem to some other primitive in quantum computing, which is to prepare Gibbs states on a quantum computer. So what is the connection of these Gibbs states and what they are to, to these STPs? Let me tell you this first. So a Gibbs state is just a thermal state of some Hamiltonian at some temperature. That's the form. is uh, the exponential of the Hamiltonian. They are, of course, very important if you want to understand the properties of the, Hamiltonian, of the system given by this Hamiltonian at some temperature, if it's at thermal equilibrium with the environment. Um, but the connection with the STP comes from an old result in statistical physics due to James uh, from 57, and it says the following. Suppose you have a quantum state, and you have a, a Hermitian operators, MI, uh, such that the expectation value of rho in these MIs gives number CIs. Then he proves that there is always a Gibbs state of this form, a Gibbs state where the Hamiltonian is given by a linear combination of these Hermitian operators that you care about, these MIs, and some real numbers, lambda i's, that you have to figure out what they are. They are like some Lagrange multipliers with the same expectation value as rho on this observable. Okay, so if all you care about, uh, uh, about rho is the expectation value on these MIs, you can just have this Gibbs state instead of it. And uh, okay, and this, like, this Gibbs state also maximizes the entropy of all states compatible with this expectation value, but we don't really need that. So okay, so let's apply this to the STPs, right? So we have our STP here again. So all we care about the SCP is really the expectation value on, right, on trace Cx and trace A sub Jx. So we can just assume that the optimal solution is of this form, right, of this exponential form in the input, or the linear, where the Hamiltonian is a linear combination of the input matrices. By Jane's principle, there is always a solution of this form. Uh, right, basically, we just apply Jane's principle to the normalized version of X optimal, and this gives this, this solution. So the problem really boils down to first finding what, what are the lambda j's, and second, uh, of trying to you know, write down this matrix in a classic computer, or maybe prepare a normalized version of this matrix on a quantum computer. And this is what we explore. Uh, so it's really, uh, uh, this is the, I guess, main conceptual idea. Uh, now let me tell you, uh, okay, so now I wanna tell you, just using this idea, what, what is the kind of results we, want, we can get? But before, let me define these two parameters of the STP, which are important. So one thing, given any STP of this form, okay, uh, there is a, another STP, which is called the dual, and this is the following. So we minimize the inner product of this vector B with Y. Y is a vector now of real numbers. And the constraint is that if you sum from uh, J equals one to M, uh, Y sub J, A sub J, this is a matrix. This matrix is, is bigger or equal to the matrix C, meaning that uh, left-hand side minus right-hand side uh, is a positive semi-definite matrix. This is the positive semi-definite constraint. And this y, element y has to be positive. So all elements of y are positive. So this is, a, this is another problem. And what you can show is that almost always under some mild conditions, 
the two solution, the two optical solutions are the same. So like you can think if you solve this one or is this one depending on the convenience. And now we can define two parameters which will be very important for the running time of our algorithm, which is the R parameter. This is consider any uh, optimal solution of the primary problem, R should be an upper bound to it. So we should be able to guess an upper bound to the size, which is just trace x because x is positive semi definite uh, of the primary solution. Right? It's like the one norm as well. The same thing you can do for the dual, but now the dual is just a vector of non zero coefficients. So the size, or the, uh, the size parameter is just an upper bound to the sum of, of no, to, the, to the L1 uh, norm of, of y as a vector. This we call a small r. And there will be important parameters in, in our approach. OK, so before, let's, let's show, uh, let me say again what, what is the best we can achieve in the worst case. So even if you want to write down the optimal solution of the primal, this takes order n square, right? Because it's an n by n Hermitian matrix. And the dual will take time m. Uh, but maybe we just want to compute the optimal value, and we don't want to write down the optimal solution. We do it implicitly. If you can show that classically it takes times n plus m, for everything else constant. Oh, I'm sorry, uh, delta is the error now. It was epsilon I changed to, to delta. S is the sparsity, and these are these parameters that I defined just before. Quantum also some easy reduction to search problem. You can show that never, you cannot do better than that. Uh, order square root n plus square root m. So okay, so the first result is there are like some general polynomial speed ups. So uh, there was a first paper with Krista that I put last year. Now there's this improvement with, with uh, with Krista and collaborators from uh, Maryland. And what we show is that there is a quantum algorithm for solving STPs and the runtime is uh, like matches the lower bound in terms of N and M, is square in the sparsity, and a polynomial in all these parameters that I'm going to tell you what it is next. So the input is the same, right, as I specified before. There is also this normalization of the matrix, the operator norm is one. But what, what is the output? This we have to specify, right, because as I said, if you want to write down all the elements of the matrix, that takes too long. So as outputs, we output like quantum samples from this quantum state. So we just prepare a quantum state, uh, which is a normalized optimal solution, right? So the optimal solution is x, and we, comp and we output x over trace x as, as a quantum state. And we also output the value of trace x. And we also output the optimal solution up to the small accuracy. Uh, so it's not the same thing as having it written down in a piece of paper, but maybe you can use right, this quantum state for something else. This, this is kind of similar to what happens in HHL. Uh, okay, so what is the Oracle model here? We assume there is an Oracle that outputs a chosen no zero entry of each one of the matrix at unit cost. So we just choose one of the matrix, which is one of the rows, which is a, a number and it out, uh, uh, like JF, and it outputs the JF no zero element of this row in the matrix of our choice. So like this is the normal model for like Hamiltonian simulation, for example. So what is good about this? Well, uh, it gives a unconditional quadratic speed ups in terms of n and m, right? Because you have this linear classical lower bound n plus m. Oh, this is not close off. This is optimal, right? In terms of n plus m, this is old. Uh, so this is optimal. We cannot improve, uh, but it is also bad. Well, it's optimal, right? So there will not be super polynomial speed ups that I told you before, and the dependence on the other parameters is bad. It's like uh, actually these three parameters they are interconnected. You can always decrease one by increasing the other one. So you should treat this ratio as really one parameter. This is what matters. And it's this one to the power of eight. So, so pretty high. Uh, so just this is the final result. But as I mentioned before, uh, with Chris, at first we proved this kind of bound n times m square root. And a huge, right, uh, to the power of 32, this, this uh, for the error. So pretty terrible, right? Then there was Alperdon, Gillian, Gribling, and, and the Wolf. They improved a lot this to, to this eighth power. Uh, and now we can improve this to n plus m, which you know, closes what we can do here, but I'm sure there is a lot we can do uh, in these other parameters. So applications, right? So, okay, uh, so if we first, okay, it's at most polynomial speed up, but if you're happy with that, where well, can we apply this STP solver? And there's some bad news. Many interesting STPs, for example, if you want to apply this to max cut using Goldsman Williamson, we have that this, this parameter, the size and error parameters, is of order n. So we're not getting speed ups. Okay, so we really have to improve the other parameters if we want to have speed ups for Goldman Williamson or some other uh, approximation to NP hard uh, combinatorial optimization problems. So they all usually have this kind of dependence. So that's that's bad. But there's also some other 
SCPs for which we, we can get some speed ups. And there are like a bunch of problems in machine learning compressed sensing for which they would give something because they have a nice, these parameters, they are like of other one there. One is quantum compressed sensing, and I, I mentioned this because there is two of the offers here in the audience. So what we want to do there is we want to topograph our, our rank R density matrix row of dimension n by n. And they show that you can do that in only roughly R times n measurements. So much better than n square if R is small. But what's the way to do that? Well, there are also other way. Uh, naively, you can just do that by solving this easy STP. You just find a density matrix for which the expectation, the expectation value on the measurements AI reproduce what you, the expectation value is on rho, which is this one that you can measure in the lab. Uh, in practice, this SCP is not very used because you want to run it super, really efficient, and this SCP is like you know, n squared times m, so that's already too high for this kind of application, where you really care about uh, you know, the order of the polynomial. But if we had a quantum computer, we don't. Uh, then right, uh, the running time, uh, we can even improve over what I told you before, would be something of this order, like r times square root of n square root of m, which is just r times n over r squared. So, um, so you know, this would be, this would beat the best way that they have of doing this kind of, uh, of compressions. All right, so this was the polynomial speed ups. Maybe they are right, uh, at least definitely for now, they are not substantial enough to try to implement them. Uh, quantum computation is very expensive. So it'd be good if you can have something more. We cannot in general. But actually, we can try as a heuristic to get bigger speed ups. So another result is that there is a quantum algorithm which solves STPs, and it runs in this time. The square root of m, this we don't improve. All these other dependencies are the same as before, but there is no dependence on n uh, as the square root of n. There is this T Gibbs instead of it. And what is this? This is the time it takes to prepare on a quantum computer Gibbs states of this form. In other words, Gibbs states given by linear combination of the input matrices. What well, is lambda i, some coefficients, real coefficients that we can compute them. And they, are, they are bounded and so on. So what it shows is that you know, when we can prepare these states efficiently, maybe we just try them out and see if it works, then we can have perhaps bigger speed ups. So we could use, for example, quantum Gibbs sampling for that. Oh, sorry, uh, these are like, we want to do quantum Gibbs sampling. We could use quantum metropolis as a heuristic or something else. And we might even have exponential speed ups if fermentation is quick, right? Like poly. Uh, in the number of qubits, which is poly log n. Um, but it's hard to prove if there are cases for which this is the case. Um, this is nice, I think, because it gives the application of this Gibbs sampling, quantum Gibbs sampling, outside simulation of physical systems. Classical Gibbs sampling is huge in many areas, right, in, in machine learning, in convex optimization, and so on. It's nice to find applications of quantum Gibbs sampling. This is one. There are also some earlier work and, uh, and like applications in machine learning, these two papers. Uh, OK, so another thing I want to mention, OK, this is about, I guess, we are all here interested in this uh, small quantum computers that we have now. It would be nice to find new applications for it. I don't know if this is one, but I'm hopeful that uh, it might be, and let me tell you why. So in the simpler version of the algorithm, uh, and then it has just a bad scaling on M. It scales linearly in M, but it's still like this T Gibbs scaling. The quantum part is very simple. It's just uh, we compute the expectation values of the AIs on Gibbs states. Uh, oh, here's the same thing. On, on the Gibbs states uh, given by linear combination. So I think because the quantum part is so simple, it's something that you can try out on these small machines and see what you get, right? So what would be the idea? I'll tell you more about the algorithm, but uh, the outline is that we have the quantum computer and we have the classical computer. The quantum computer is just that each time we have a new uh, Hamiltonian, which is a linear combination. These are the coefficients of the input matrices. We just, um, we just compute the expectation value of uh, these Gibbs states with the input matrices, AI, and these are number CIT. Then we send this number to the class computer, and then there is a very easy procedure that I'm going to tell later what it is, which just computes new coefficients, new i, which then you fit forward here again. Okay? And you repeat that very, uh, like, uh, log n times, and then you converge. This is what you prove. So really, like, the quantum part is you should be able to uh, to design a Hamiltonian of your choice, which depends on the input matrix, and let it cool, let, let it thermalize to a given temperature. Uh, and I tell you what the temperature range is. So, um, so this is something you can do, you can try to do just right by cooling down the system or some other method. So, um, and of course, we won't get the Gibbs state perfectly, we have some errors and so on, and this I haven't analyzed really, but uh, maybe it's not so bad. So uh, this is something for future work. So what is a special case, just understand this connection with uh, like cooling and annealing. Suppose you just want to compute the maximum eigenvalue of C. 
This is a very simple SCP, right? We just want to maximize trace CX where X is a density matrix. So this is a well-studied problem, right? So this is just really quantum annealing. We just uh, want to compute the ground state energy of the C, if you see as a Hamiltonian, if you just, okay, of, of minus C, actually. Uh, and if you can prepare these Gibbs states with this um, temperature, inverse temperature one over delta, or temperature delta, then we can compute the maximum eigenvalue to error delta. Or here, I'm using physics normalization where like, you know, the, the norm of the Hamiltonian scales as, as the volume, right, instead of being constant. Then the temperature is constant like that. And, and the point is that uh, our approach of, for this Gibbs sample then is really a generalization of quantum annealing, right? In quantum annealing, usually this C is classical. Here we have a C which is quantum, and we care about non-zero temperature. So just some comparison. So we have quantum annealing here. We have this quantum SCP solver. The Hamiltonian quantum annealing is usually classical or interest. Here we're interested in general quantum Hamiltonians. The temperature in annealing should be zero, right? So, uh, at least ideally. Here we don't care about zero. If you want to solve the SCP with error delta, temperature delta squared is, is enough. So there might be advantage. And what, how, what is the preparation of the Gibbs state? Well, uh, in annealing, we can do cooling, right? Just cool down the system. But there is also adiabatic evolution. There is this QAOA. There are many alternatives. It's a well-studied problem. Here, not so much, right? This is an open question. So we can cool down the system. That's one way. We could use quantum metropolis, but that's very costly for small quantum computers. Are there like analogs of these two for Gibbs states? That's an interesting question that uh, I don't really know the answer, but I think it's worth exploring more. OK, so uh, actually, how am I on time? I have 20 minutes. Perfect. OK, thanks. OK, so let me go to the, to the final results uh, before I tell you a little bit more about the algorithm. And this is a situation where uh, we can have bigger speed ups. So where is the, well, I think you cannot see it anyway. right? So th there is a quantum algorithm for solving SCPs. And, and now it runs in time square root of m, the same thing in terms of the constraints. But now uh, poly log in n, so that's an improvement. Everything else is the same, but also there's a rank. And this rank will be the rank of all the input matrices of the problem. But there's an important catch. This is only if data is in what we call quantum form. Let me tell you what it is. It's a different Oracle model now. So the Oracle model is that uh, we assume there is an Oracle that given i outputs uh, the eigenvalues of ai and the eigenvectors as quantum states. Or actually, more precisely, in the later version, uh, if you assume, for example, that this is uh, positive same definite, we should be able to prepare a purification of the normalized state onto this AI. So this is some old version. And the rank is just the maximum rank of all of this. So if you have, uh, for some reason, this, this Oracle model, then you, you can get an algorithm that only scales with the rank of the matrix instead of n. right? And this can give some advantage sometimes if, if they are low rank, for example. So what is the idea? I won't tell you much about it. but uh, I just want to tell you that this is one of, this is an instance where we can actually uh, solve the Gibbs sampling problem and show that it converts faster than, uh, than just like uh, square root n, which is the worst case using Grove. So, so we just show uh, that we can perform the Gibbs sampling uh, easily in the sense that efficiently here in, in poly log n rank time. And the proof, uh, we, which is in this uh, second paper that I mentioned, it uses a quantum principle component analysis uh, to actually first prepare roughly like uh, the maximum mixed state on the common subspace of all uh, on all of these matrices, and then to do the Hamiltonian evolution there, and to do phase estimation, and so on, what you expect. But it's very important to have it in quantum form, because then we can really prepare initial states, which has a non-negligible overlap with, all the sp with the space where all these matrices live. So that's, uh, that's why this quantum model is, is useful. Uh, OK, of course, there's a the question, how relevant is this model, right? And I, I don't really know. Uh, but there's one, one application that we thought about that I want to mention. It's also about quantum learning, but a little bit different from this compressed sensing, because you don't want to do full tomography here. So what, what are we interested in here is that we have a set of measurements, AI, let's assume they are projectors. Uh, and we have access to copies of unknown quantum states. And I would just want to find, we want to again find a description of the quantum state, uh, description of sigma, but only that reproduce the statistics on, on this on these measurements AI. Okay? Uh, and we don't care about really full tomography. We just want to mimic the expectation value in these AIs. This is a STP, right? So this will be the BJs, if you put in the formulation I showed you before, where we just search over this density matrix sigma. Uh, we have an oracle for B, BI just by measuring AI on row, right? Just we do the experiment, and then this, this gives us BI. 
And let's assume that there is also an efficient way of, of measuring this AI, okay, in, in polylog n time. They're like, uh, there's an efficient quantum circuit for it. Uh, then, using the, what I showed you before, uh, we can find these lambda i's, and we can find a circuit that constructs the, the state sigma, satisfying these conditions in this time. Uh, so square root of m, but polynomial in the rank of the matrices. So if you care about low rank measurements, and, and honestly, right, usually we don't care about a low rank measurements. Usually local measurement has very high rank, for example. So, so that's why this perhaps ha has uh, limited applicability. But, but nonetheless, if you care about this low rank measurements, you could have larger speed ups over the classical approach, which we don't know, I don't know how to do anything better than just really compute these expectation values and running the classical SCP, right, which, which takes at least like time leaning. And, uh, okay, so what is the algorithm? So first, uh, as I mentioned, the algorithm is, is based on this idea that we have this uh, solution of the SCP, which is always a quantum Gibbs state. And actually there are many uh, people explore that Classically, for classical SCP solvers, I, I forgot to put the reference, unfortunately, but this was first paper by uh, Aurora and Keio, and then a paper by Hazan, and they proposed different ways of exploring this, you know, this solution of the SCP as, as, a, as a Gibbs state to come up with, with, solu with solvers, and this is what they call this multiplicative weight methods. Uh, multiplicative because kind of you put, uh, you get a violated constraint and you put a penalty. Uh, multiplicativity, which just means adding something to the exponents of, of these Gibbs states, right? Classic, you just multiply it. Quantum, you have to add something to the exponents of the e to the h. Uh, so here, you know, after like many versions of, of, this, of this procedure and look at the classical solvers and try to simplify it, there is a, a version that I like because it's, it's pretty simple. So this is that I want to explain to you. So first, let's look at a particular case. There is a reduction to the general case. We just want to find a density matrix row for which trace a sub i rho is smaller than bi, okay? So now uh, it's a quantum state. And how we wanna do that? Well, we wanna find the lambda i's in Jane's principle, right, that achieves the solution, but we wanna do that by interactive arguments. So what we do, we start from, from the maximum mixed states, okay? And then we iterate uh, 16 times log n over epsilon squared times the following procedure. So first, we do quantum Gibbs sample uh, and we prepare square root M copies other of this row sub t. Um, on note, right, that's actually the capital R and, and small r, they are constants here because it's quantum state. So that's why they don't appear here. In the, the general reduction, they would appear again. Uh, then, okay, we have this number of copies of row. And then with this number of copies of row, we just, using Grover, uh, or some versions of Grover, we search for a index i such that a trace a sub i rho t is bigger than bi plus epsilon over two. So we're looking for a, a violation of one of the constraints, okay? So we find a constraint, right? So if all the constraints are satisfied, we are happy. We find one which is not, which is violated up to this arrow epsilon over two. And then we let i sub t to be this violated constraint. And then what we do, this is like the multiplicative step. We just add uh, the constraint into the Hamiltonian as a penalty, right? So we just add, we have our original Hamiltonian, which is h, right, this is just h, log uh, rho sub c. We add minus epsilon square a i sub c to it. So we always find a violating constraint and we just add it to the exponential. And we repeat that, and what we can show is that it will converge. In the end, we have a solution which, which satisfies all the constraints up to some small error. And then we, we can put the error, we can massage this error to really satisfy it perfectly if you want, but don't worry about this. So what is the, what is the complexity of this? So if you use phase estimation and amplitude amplification, uh, Poulain and Vossian showed us that we can do the Gibbs sampling in time square root n, okay? But we need to write, uh, if you just put this together, this gives the uh, complexity square root m times n, which is this first one that I told you. It's not this option that we found. To get the option, I won't explain, but let me just tell you what is the new idea. Uh, to get this uh, square root n plus m, uh, we have to use uh, quantum or bounds, which is, from this paper by Harold and Montanaro. It's, it's a nice result and we improve it to, to, uh, with amplitude amplification to do it faster. And that's really the idea that you need to, to get this, but uh, let me skip that. Okay, so let me now give an intuition why it works, right? So, so why you converge so fast? It's crucial that we are converging in log n time here, right? So if, if conversion would be polynomial in n or m, uh, we'll be doomed. But it's really fast. 
And this is because of nice arguments. Uh, there are many ways to see that. So one way that I like is using uh, relative entropy. Basically, you just have a cost function, which is in the case will be the relative entropy, and it shows it decreases at each iteration. And because this cost function, the maximum value is not too big, you cannot have too many iterations before you converge. So, so let rho just be a feasible solution. Then there is this pyrus bogoli both inequality. I, I don't write what it is, but it's, it's well known. And if you write in terms of rho, rho sub t, and rho sub t minus 1, you get these constraints, right, where this is the definition of rho sub t. So you have to trust me. I think you cannot do it yourself now, but you get this. You say that we can show that the relative entropy from step t to step t minus 1 will decrease uh, by this factor, minus epsilon over 8, and then trace a i sub t rho minus rho t. But now, uh, suppose that uh, at some step, Grover's, OK, suppose that, what, what will happen? So we, uh, I, I didn't tell you, but if, in, in case Grover's search fails, then we are happy, right? Because if Grover's search fails, we, we have uh, rho sub t, which satisfies all the constraints, approximately at least. So the bad case is when Grover, uh, when it's Grover search never fails for all the iterations. Uh, and then if it never fails, at each time step, we have this, right? We have that this trace a i sub t rho minus rho t is smaller than minus epsilon over 2. So if you plug this in, we see that each time we have to decrease this relative entropy by roughly, by uh, epsilon square over 16, right? Each time we reduce it by that. But the maximum value of the relative entropy, because rho sub 0 is just maximum mix, is log n. So really, after 16 log n over epsilon squared steps, the relative entropy would become negative. It's a contradiction. So we must stop before that. Right? So, that so that's the proof. Uh, so Grover's search must fail at some t prime is smaller than t. And this shows that this rule uh, sub t prime is, is feasible, um, which is what we wanted to do. OK, so uh, that's all. Uh, so I, I show you that quantum computers can give speed ups for solving STPs. It's, it's complicated what kind of speed ups, and right, we're still figuring out what, what is the extent. There are many open questions. Some of them is, can we find relevant settings with large speed ups? I'll show you one in quantum learning. Uh, I'm not, not sure how relevant it is, but it's one. It would be great to try to find more. So there is this dependence on, on capital R, small r over delta is, is prohibitive right, for many applications. Can we improve on it? And actually, if you use these quantum interior points, classically, they have a worse scale in terms of m and, or n but they have a logarithmic scaling in terms of this parameter, right? So this is really great. So, so if you could get a quantum version of the interior point, I think it would be very exciting. You really need new ideas. I have no idea how to do it, but I think it's a, this, uh, improving this dependence gives a good motivation to explore this question, I think. What is the robustness to error of the procedure, right? So these Gibbs states, you know, like hand wave, you expect they are robust to error, right? So you have a Gibbs state, it's equilibrium, but of course, uh, it would be nice to, if that's actually the case and, and to make it's, uh, and to study this problem more. And if that's the case, if there is some robustness to error, uh, the quantum computers, right, they're only used for this Gibbs sampling, at least if you don't want to have speed ups in terms of the number of constraints. Is this a potential application for small size quantum computers? I, I don't know, but I would like to figure out. So that's all, thank you. Yes. You all want to learn or the other one? Uh, the new. I mean, yeah, this? Yeah. So um, there, I mean, you can think of that as, like, if I think of that thing inside the box as a vector indexed by i, then this is a bound on the infinity norm of that vector. And you're trying to learn, um, you're trying to learn, like, all of those expectation values up to some bound on the infinity norm. No, the expectation values you're given, because you can just measure them. Oh, sorry, sorry. You want to uh, find, find, find sigma. The output is a description of sigma. Sorry, yeah, yeah, yeah. You, wanted to find, you want to find a sigma. What, sorry, what I, was, what I meant to say is, if I change that to something other than the infinity norm. Oh, I see. Um, yeah, I mean, I'm not saying one norm, right? But just a, even a little bit away from infinity. Um, like the log n norm or something. I don't care. Just a little bit off of infinity. Can you, you say anything you can about that case? Because I mean, this would be, if you wanted to try to use this idea for tomography, it's going to be poorly conditioned. Yeah. But if you can, if you can, I mean, if you could do it in the one norm, right, then of course you can, you can actually invert this and do tomography. So the question is, is there any meaningful sense in which you can get 
Um, I mean, yeah, I think just thinking of this thing as a norm and yeah. asking if you can get away from infinity yeah, I understand at all the question. is an interesting it, it's, question. It's a good question. I, the approach we're doing right now, I, I don't see how to improve it. Okay. Uh, right, because just the proof I gave is very simple. You really have this, this epsilon in each, in each of the constraints, or in the, right in each of the constraints of the STP. Uh, but I don't, I mean, I it's, still, it's, is, it's still convex, right? It's, st it's still convex if you do this, right? So. I'm not sure, sure, yeah, but it's just whether you can, yeah, yeah. whether you can get quantum speed ups for this setting. Yeah, it's a good question, but I don't know. Yeah, maybe, okay, yeah. thanks. It'd be nice, yeah, if we can do it. Thank you. I think I noticed that the dependence on the error was linear in all the cases. No. Um, is it like this? No. Uh, you had a one of an error to the eighth power, right? To the eighth power. Yeah. So uh, I know there's a paper by Robin Kotari where they did, uh -huh. um, where they got exponential improvement on the dependence of the error for the HHL type algorithms. That's right. So is it possible to use the idea, those types of ideas, to improve your? Um, yeah. So that, that, that's a good question, and uh, the answer is I think no with this approach because this approach they improve a lot of the error because they improve. In the end, it's like because they can really improve the error of the Hamiltonian simulation, right? And we do use Hamiltonian simulation, and this part you could improve with their techniques, but the error is really coming from, from this kind of reasoning, right? That uh, they know you really need one of our epsilon square iterations here to get epsilon approximation. So you really will have to change these parts, which is just kind of the classical parts. So that's why I think if, if something like this works, and it would be very nice, I think, probably you have to go to quantum interior point methods, because interior point method is the way classically people achieve log one of error. Right, so I think, and then it's a new research project. We like, they are very <laughs> different methods. I don't know how to do it. Okay, thank you. Thank you. So thank you. So I think if I'm not mistaken, the SDP can be approximated by many L linear programming LPs, right? The constraint. So SDP is a, is a so the, LP the, the is a subset of SDPs, right? Yeah, but then I think the, the polytope of the uh, SDP can be approximated by many infinite number of LPs. So probably you can use HHL algorithm for that. Do you see any connection? No, because, because first, uh, you cannot use HHL even for LPs, right? We don't know how to do it. Oh. Because L, actually, this, this bounds that I show you, uh, square root n plus m, they were for LPs already. So for LPs already, you cannot have uh, exponential speed ups quantum in the worst case. Uh, so really, just change it from, yeah, that's a good point, but just change it from having a, a system of linear equations to have a system of, of uh, inequalities, that, that, it's a, that matters a lot, right? You go from, yeah, from this exponential speed up to at most polynomial speed ups in the worst case. So these upper bounds that you state, I just wanted to confirm, are they all in the, uh, these time complexity upper bounds, are they all in the, Quantum circuit model, or do you use quantum RAM? So, uh, w w wait, the, the upper bounds? Y yeah, just your, you know, the uh, root n plus root m and all the, the algorithms or the lower the algor uh, The algorithms. Oh, oh, yeah, no, the algorithm. They, well, they use quantum RAM in the sense uh, that you need this oracle that, given the input matrix, right. gives the element of the matrix. Uh, no, that's fine. Yeah, so you have oracle access to the entries of all of these matrices: this a yeah. one to a m and yeah. c. That's fine. Yeah, but so that's you, all. You, that's all you need. That's all. You don't, in addition, need quantum RAM to store data or anything during the process of that um, algorithm. Well, it depends, it depends on the version, right? So if you, this basic version, no, because really just like formalization of these cube states, right? Mm -hmm. and, and that's it. There is also these versions with, uh, like to get this credit of n plus m, you have to use this quantum R. Um, and there, I'm not, there you might need, I, shall, no, you don't need, no, okay, so you don't need, yeah. I, Okay, I, I'm not completely sure what he says, he's done it, so okay, fine. I will okay. trust my power. Yeah. Thanks.